You may be seated. Good morning, church. Well, I'm going to be honest. I did not anticipate that I would be standing um, in this space again um, so soon after last week. Um, But if this week has taught me anything about ministry and the work of ministry, it is that um, flexibility and adaptability and responsiveness to the needs of the moment are very important. Um, These past few days have also taught me um, a crash course in the art of writing a collaborative sermon. Um, So I do want to acknowledge that while um, I am the one standing here delivering these words today, um, there's much of Lee's heart and wisdom in them as well. This week, it has been another week of heartbreak where the only appropriate responses are to feel anger and despair at the unrelenting scourge of gun violence that engulfs our country and takes ever more lives. There was no time to process fully the horror of Buffalo before the mass shooting at Uvalde happened, multiplying that horror. 19 children and two teachers mercilessly gunned down in their classroom. A haunting reminder of the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting that took the lives of 20 children and six adults. And we collectively realized that nothing since then had changed other than perhaps that our children now practice hiding under desks and in closets as part of their school curriculum. It feels increasingly difficult to believe that there is any way forward that is different. We feel dangerously close to becoming completely resigned to the situation as it is. I've had more than one person confide in me, lamenting. I want to believe this is the moment things will change, that this will finally be the wake-up call. But if we did nothing after Sandy Hook, why will now be any different? And I've got to be honest. I've struggled with the same question based on what I know. If I focus only on the things that are in my purview, like the number of politicians beholden to the NRA, hope for a real and substantive change in policy that prioritizes life over guns, that feels like more like delusion. But my view is rather limited and self-centered. It centers what I know, and it doesn't even attempt to engage what I don't know. This view also leaves God out of it entirely, as if the ultimate power of our moment is the evil force of the gun lobby. And while I do believe it is something fierce, I know, God, the movement of peace and justice and love It is bigger and wider than a bunch of humans clinging to their guns and their white supremacy and their need to control others. Even the small bit about God that I know and have encountered, it's more potent than this temporal power of the moment. So maybe in this moment, we can take solace from all that we know we don't know. The other day, I was learning about dark energy. Astrophysicist Mario Livio spent 24 years at the Space Telescope Science Institute of the Hubble Telescope. He studied phenomena like dark energy and white dwarf stars. As Livio reflected on his work, he noted that it wasn't until 1998 
that we even knew dark energy existed. 1998. And today, we know that dark energy is the dominant form of energy in our universe. We didn't even know of its existence 25 years ago. A central component of the makeup of our universe was unheard of just a few decades ago. The implications of that are powerful. Livio reflected, whenever you think you've reached some sort of a point that you can't get beyond, thinking, okay, this is all there is to know. Somehow, we discover that there is yet something more mysterious that hides behind all of that. We are there, I think, having reached a moment when we believe that we can't get beyond the status quo, beyond how things are. This is it. But friends, how much room have we left for mystery, for God to move and make new what is dead and dying? We sure have managed to put God in a tight box with that way of thinking. Our scripture comes at this from a different way, but it gets to a similar point. Paul is in Athens in this week's text because he keeps hitting walls. He entered Macedonia, as we learned last week, and he met Lydia because the Spirit prevented him from preaching the word in Asia. Today, we encounter him in Athens, alone. He's alone because after preaching the word in several cities in Macedonia and gaining quite a few converts along the way, Paul has riled some people up. He now has a crowd of violent, angry people after him people accusing him of turning their world upside down because his message of the good news of the inclusive love of God is threatening the social and economic order of Rome. Now, when Paul arrives in Athens, he could have just laid low. Perhaps that would have been the smarter thing to do while waiting for his traveling companions to rejoin him. But Paul, Paul has glimpsed the mystery beyond the walls of certitude we erect, the walls of what is possible and impossible based on what we know of the world. Paul has seen the risen Christ and it compels him ever onward. The Athenians Paul encounters are a unique audience. Unlike so many others, they are totally open to the possibility of something more. They are convinced that there is more than they understand, more than they know of life and divine power. That openness leads them to erect an altar to an unknown God. We enter the text just after Paul engages in a series of debates with some Epicureans and some Stoics, two of the leading philosophical schools of the day. They invite him to accompany them to the Council of the Areopagus because they were interested in, yet also a little unclear about what he was teaching. They want to hear more, to learn more. They're actively searching for meaning in the mystery. The Council of the Areopagus was the governing body responsible for adding any new deities to the pantheon of gods. Because Paul was speaking of Jesus and resurrection, some scholars speculate that the Athenians likely thought the resurrection, which is a grammatically feminine word in Greek, was the companion goddess of Jesus. And they wanted to examine whether this new god and goddess that Paul was presenting to them was up to par. They had such a strong idea in their head of what Paul was talking about based on their ideas of the world and their concepts of God, or gods, that it prevented them from understanding what Paul was actually proclaiming, Jesus' resurrection from the dead. 
They could not comprehend a God who makes life from death. So imagine with me for a moment Paul standing in front of the council of Areopagus, deftly making his case, preparing the Athenians to hear the good news of the resurrection by using the words of their own poets and philosophers. Paul speaks their language, recognizing that they do have a partial view of God. He wants to prepare them for an invitation to view the divine from a different perspective. Paul prepares his listeners for a choice. Are they willing to let go of their certitude and join Paul in the sacred search for the one who is not really far from any of us? The one who transcends the cosmic order they thought they knew, an order philosophized by Aristotle who lived in Greece nearly 400 years before Paul's arrival there. Paul was extending an invitation to believe in a God who is more than what we assign or assume. He was extending an invitation to let go of ideas about God and the world and people in it that we hold on to so tightly, preventing us from bearing witness to God's love and preventing us from participating in God's ongoing creative action in the world. For Paul to follow Jesus means to believe in the one who shatters what we think we know to be true over and over. It is to hit a wall and to still believe that there is something more beyond it made possible by the power of God. There is something mysterious that hides behind what we see as a final obstacle and that compels us to keep searching for it grasping for God to reveal what we can't yet fathom. We know aspects of God. We hold them dear. We relate to them regularly. Jesus as friend and companion when we are bereft. Spirit that pushes us into discomfort to confront what we have done wrong to make it right. The God of love who loves us even when we don't love ourselves. We know all these and they are powerful ways of interacting with God. But there is so much more and we are only able to draw power and possibility from what we engage with. We are never to tire of learning how deep and wide and vast the love of God is. As Lee and Julia and Nancy and Brent and I set up for Wednesday night's vigil, hanging signage and running cords and setting out candles, many neighbors pause to take in the scene. One after the other stopped to say thank you, to take a picture, to ask when it was starting so they could join us. One passerby got off a bike and stood quietly for several minutes. She took a few photos. Then finally she approached Lee. She said, going to ask you a question you won't like. Of course, Lee said to bring it on. The woman with the bike asked, why bother? Why do this here? 90% of the people in this city support gun laws and policies. What is this going to accomplish? She had hit a wall. Lee, always armed with compassion and a willingness to engage heart forward, responded. What we do on the corner of this earth, it doesn't just affect us. What we do here has impact across the city 
and the state and the nation. What we do and say in response to tragedy matters. But it won't change the Republicans or the NRA, the woman lamented. We don't know that, Lee gently offered. And what's more, we need to tend to our broken hearts. We need to come together to fight against the isolation and the dislocation an act of terror can cause. We, we can comfort one another. And that's not nothing. The woman agreed to that, relenting. That is true. And she wrote off. On Wednesday, comfort came to me in remembering and connecting to those aspects of God that I know to be true and need desperately. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It is amazing grace that has gotten us this far and through danger, toil, and snare. And most important, when we hold each other's hands stand next to each other and weep together. We find God in our midst, in sacred community. I depend on these aspects of God that I know to help get me through tragedy. But there is more to God than we know. There is more to God and we need to cling to that unknowingness too, because there's power in that. There is hope in that. I have encountered the God who resurrects. I have experienced the God who surprises me. I know that divinity pulses through each of us and all of creation, revealing aspects with each new moment. So who am I to say what can happen beyond this point, this horror? I feel certain that God's action in our world is well beyond what any of us can imagine. So I'm not going to count God out now. And I hope you won't either. Amen. <laughs>